Hi, my name is Tom Wiscom, Chair of the BARC program at SciArc, and this is SciArc Channel. Today, I'm in conversation with Timothy Morton. Timothy Morton is the Rita Shea Guffey Chair in English at Rice University. He gave the prestigious Wellick Lectures in Theory at the University of California, Irvine in 2014. He's the author of the forthcoming books, Dark Ecology, For a Logic of Future Coexistence, and Nothing, Three Inquiries in Buddhism and Critical Theory. Other books include Hyperobjects, Philosophy and Ecology After the End of the World, The Ecological Thought, and Ecology Without Nature, to name just a few, as well as numerous essays on philosophy, ecology, literature, music, art, design, and food. Morton's writing offers critical reflections on our changing ideas of nature and ecology. Professor Morton, I'd like to welcome you to SciArc, and I'm really looking forward to this discussion I have been for a couple of days. I'm so honored to have been welcomed. You know, and it's really, really nice to be here, and it's so good for me. I mean, basically, I look on this kind of event as like my lab, you know, and if I didn't have that, I wouldn't be able to think the stuff that I think, you know, in part because I'm a bit daft, but also because I feel like thinking is a physical process that like happens in between people and like interactions with people. So I'm terribly grateful to you for giving me this well, opportunity to kind of parallel play a little bit. It's the same for us on the other mm. end. Having somebody like you come in mm. um, can create the, the most unexpected thoughts, you mm. know, in the work that we're doing. I remember one thing that mm. was really intriguing that we were talking about yesterday, which was mm. um, this idea of the, the problem of the whole. Mm -hmm. And I was picking up on that specifically mm. because, you know, in architecture we talk a lot about holes yes. and parts and part to whole relationships. Thank goodness somebody does, actually. Yes, I, and that's yeah, yeah. one of the reasons why I think there's this resonance between, yeah. between also you know, your work and your interests and, yeah. and a lot of architects these days. Yeah, I think so too. Um, and I think it's a really, it's, a, it's, it's an ontological problem that it's finds its way yeah. into architecture. And I, I think right now, yeah. Yeah. you know, ontological problems and also epistemological problems mm. are, are really a, a big, piece of contemporary discourse in architecture. Yeah, so I'm really, doubt. I think that's one of the reasons why, why you know, yeah. we're, we're, we're interested in each other, I guess. Well, you know, and that's actually a symptom of the fact that human beings are now, you know, realizing that we are surrounded and penetrated and permeated by and couldn't exist without all these non-humans, all of a sudden they sort of showed up on our radar. I mean, obviously, intuitively, there are bunny rabbits and we sort of know that, right? But like, somehow it's become really key to every aspect of how we think and like the first way that manifests is as a sort of everything stops and everything becomes really stymied and you get this sort of epistemological ontological sort of puzzles that happen you know and I feel like that's part of my job is kind of like helping us to go over that speed bump. I have this counterintuitive holism which is sort of like what we normally think but upside down like we keep telling ourselves that the whole is always greater than the sum of its parts. But there's no real reason for that, apart from just wanting to sort of retweet something to do with monotheism. And I feel like that's one of the things that's been getting in the way of genuinely, yes. you know, coexisting with, you know, polar bears or whatever. Exactly. And so I was in this architecture class and I was being, you know, I was the sort of, you know, go-to person to talk about these hyper-object things at my school. And Albert Pope um, had me into his class about megacities, you know, and they were like, well, we, we have this problem, Tim. Where are they? I mean, they're really, like, obvious, but, like, how do you define them? How do you even point to them? They're so sort of sprawly and they don't have a center and all that kind of thing. Yes. Welcome to Los Angeles, Tim. It suddenly occurred to me maybe the reason is not that there's no such thing as LA, but that actually you're sort of looking for it in the wrong place. Like, you're expecting it to transcend and be greater than somehow the sum of its parts, but actually maybe the secret is it's less than the sum of its parts. And as soon as that came out of my mouth, I'm like, oh, this works. This is actually like a really helpful idea. And somehow it really works with architecture, doesn't it? So for example, say you just building a road, you know, at some point some frogs are going to like leap across that road, right, and you probably didn't have them in mind, you probably just had human beings in mind when you were making it, but like at some point that's going to happen, so why didn't you think to build a little like tunnel for them to sort of go under, right, why wasn't that part of your project, right, and so somehow there's so much more you can do with the road 
right, than just walk along it or drive along it. You can sort of hop across it with wet, webbed feet, and that's also something you can do with the road, right? There's so many more things to the road yeah. than just this roadness, right? That's sort of roughly it. Yeah. I love this idea, though, of like Los Angeles. You know, you know, we all know it has all of these mm. diverse centers and, and kind of mm. worlds, independent worlds, and it's so yeah. true. You, you cheapen it and you reduce it when you when you sort of put a circle around it and you yes. say it's this thing. Yeah. You lose all of its all of its color and its, right. and its you know and its flavor. And right. All. And I, I think that's that's exactly the sometimes the problem right. in architecture, particularly in theories of, of part to whole, where yeah. where the architect is pushing towards the whole, always the whole, and oh. the parts get subjugated no, by this idea of the whole. With this, right? Exactly, right? Because the point is that kind of holism is basically treating all the parts as like components yes. of a machine. And so the point is those components are replaceable and they don't really matter. Right. We were also talking mm. yesterday about just the, the cheapening in general of things, um, not only cheapening, mm. but the kind of mysterious vaporousness of a lot of words that are floating around. Yeah, true. Know? And I know one, a big one for you is nature. Uh, yeah. You know, can, you, can you see it anywhere in here? Is, yeah. it, under, is it in my yeah, pants that? maybe? Or yeah, like, what does it look like? It's that? green, we know that. Yeah, it's under, if you peel open, whatever it is you'll find it you know yes. somewhere in there there's so many you know i mean mm. you know words like world as well are very world. very confusing you know city yeah is general, I, generalizing. I, I i believe in world world is also one of these really cheap concepts mm -hmm. like world sure everything has a world but like as von Oxkull would say, sort of like insects and like other life forms have worlds just like human beings yes. do. But once you've like decided that, what you've done is you've made world super, super cheap and you can no longer use it to justify the destiny of humans. It's sort of like things aren't exactly as they seem, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. It just means yes. that they, they kind of slightly exist. I'm very I'm into this idea that things sort of quasi or slightly or sort of a little bit exist. You know, Can and you I think that, that more? well, in order to get there you have to have a kind of modal logic, right? where you can be sort of right or half wrong or nearly mm. true. All that kind of stuff intrigues yes. me, right? Um, because I think my job is not to like enforce black versus white, yes. but to like discover the many, many shades of grey, right? Everybody likes to say that, right? But that's the whole point. Otherwise, you know, there's not much hope for things like meadows, because meadows, ecosystems, clouds, life forms, right? They're all kind of blobby, partial, slightly incomplete beings, right? And if you take a piece out of a meadow, say you take a blade of grass, right? Is it still a meadow? Yes. So you take another blade of grass out. Is it still a meadow? Yes, so you take another minute, blah, 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 blah. wash, rinse, repeat. According to the logic, you can have the entire thing devoid of grass. Now all the birds have flown away, there's no trees anymore, everything's totally dried up, and still there's a meadow, according to your logic. So basically, meadows can't be real, so we might as well build a parking lot, right? What I'm doing here is giving you an example of what is called the Sorites paradox, which is the problem of the heap. Right, like mm -hmm. what constitutes a heap, and so many things in our world are heaps, right? Like so many lumps and heaps clouds, frogs, yeah. groups of people, ecosystems, bioregions. Like, if you want to care about life forms, you've got to get behind heaps being real, you know. But if, for example, you say, Well, there is a meadow, then you can get to this point that I just got to where you can just eliminate it. It's so paradoxical. So, you have to allow the meadow to exist but not in this completely solid, tangible way. And somehow, that's the kind of logic that we need to be going for if we're going to be truly ecological people. It's one of those conundrums that is quite difficult to wrap your head around at mm. first. And it just takes time to right. start to understand, you know, that for instance, that the cells, like some some degree of right. of, in, of independence of the cells in my body and the organs mm. in my body and, and me mm. all existing mm. together um, yes. Without hierarchy. Right, without how Well, you see, now, what we're talking about here is um, object-oriented ontology. Oh, yeah. Because what we're saying is that if things exist, then they exist in exactly the same way, right? So a thought exists in the same way as a lemon, in the same way as a bunch of lemons, yes. in the same way as a lemon slice, right? In the same way as a sentence about lemons. That all of those things exist in the same way, right? Okay, so here's your lemon, right? Unfortunately, it's invisible, but now you go, we don't have props, right? So here's your lemon. 
And like, there's all these parts to the lemon. There's a little, the peel bit, you know, just save that off, stick it in some martini, fantastic. Then there's all the little segments, right? And the pith and all that stuff, right? There's, yeah. Now, this is childishly simple, but counterintuitive, as it you is. say, because the lemon is one, yes. ontologically, and all the parts are obviously more than one. Yes. Therefore, there's always more parts than whole. It's so blindingly, ridiculously obvious that nobody ever yeah. thinks about yeah. it, yeah. except yeah. for this daft guy that you're talking to, <laughs> who thinks that this might actually be quite a helpful thing yes. for us to think, yes. as we struggle with these great big massive things that seem to have this huge, like, control over us, and we're caught in their jaws, you know, like, I don't know what, global warming, biosphere, neoliberalism, and all these things. Yes. Maybe these things are actually, like, physically massive and very scary and intense, but ontologically tiny and totally capable of being dealt with because they contain so much more. I suppose mm. what we're sustaining is a human-scaled mode in which things are kind of pretty hunky-dory for humans kind of thing. And how's that been working out right. for the last 12 right. and a half thousand right. years? We've terraformed the earth right. now, as, you, yeah. as, 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 you, as you've said, yeah. with layers of you know, uh, radioactive yeah. material, right. Uh, right. Um, and the other, fossil fuels. And the other thing is like sustaining implies that, that things can remain constantly present. And I don't believe in this constant presence thing. I think it's like Santa Claus talking of Father Christmas and all that. Architects are in a fantastic space to realize that, right? Because you're making things that you know are going to crumble. They have an amortization rate. They go way, way beyond your lifespan, yeah. possibly, potentially, and so on and so on, right? And you know that bats are gonna live there and there's gonna be the, you know, our friend Ronnie or whoever he is hopping across the surface of the whatever that is. And um, you know that the sunlight's gonna come in through that window and do this thing that nobody ever sees or cares about, you know? You ever read Virginia Woolf, the, 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 To the Lighthouse? There's this chapter in the middle where it's called Time Passes and there's no people in it. It's just like dust falling in the sunlight, in the window frame and all that kind of stuff. And it's so beautiful, right? And it's sort of like how you have to think if you're in architecture space. So I'm really curious about your new book that's coming out. Oh. And, uh, um, just to get serious here yeah, for a minute. Yeah, let's get serious. Uh, dark, dark Ecology. Dark um, Ecology. Uh, I don't know if you want to, like, what, um, how, are you, how are you building off of the argument from, from hyper objects? Yeah, absolutely. Dark Ecology. Dark ecology why is it dark? Dark must mean depressing, right? <laughs> and so we've got this thing that we tell ourselves all the time, right. which is that if it's depressing, it must be true. It's not that exactly. Maybe it's, it's horrifying, okay? I can only understand extinction properly for maybe one second a day. If I talk about it too much, I'm gonna start crying, for real. So I can only let that in. If we are talking about grief, we're talking about something horrible, right? And yet, it's not just horrible, it's weird, right? Because it's like discovering that you are, like, it's like in a tragedy, like, oh my God, no, more like film noir, like angel heart, like I'm holding the murder weapon. Ah, it's me, like, ah, you know. So it's got this kind of twisty quality, right? It's yes. got the noir, that's part of the darkness, right? It's this weird twisty. And why is that, right? That's because actually life forms are weird and twisty. And why is that? Because like lampshades are weird and twisty and like sofas are weird and twisty and lemon slices are weird and twisty, you know, kind of inevitably. And like, somehow at that moment, you realize that the darkness also has this sweet quality because there's a kind of smile that starts to happen. And I, I'm glad that you're smiling because somehow, in the end, things get so ridiculous that you have to laugh. It's like that bit in The Thing, the John Carpenter yes. version, where finally this that. thing, like this upside down head that's like this, basically there's this thing that's simulating people and you can't tell, but then when you threaten it, it sort of, bursts out of the people simulations that it's made and this head pops off this guy and sprouts these spider legs and crawls out from under the, the table through the door making this horrible sort of melancholic sighing sound and one of the characters who ironically is the thing at that point but he doesn't know looks at it and goes you gotta be kidding and they put the flamethrowers on it yeah and it's come almost to that point yeah. with ecological awareness, but we're not there yet. We're still in horror mode. We're still thinking, ah, oh, make it stop, make it stop, like Home Alone, Macaulay Culkin kind of face, you know, but like what we're saying about it is this incredible macho, uh, sort of negative 
nihilistic threat display, mostly, right now. And I've made this crazy map, D&D style, in this book. This is what this book's about, in the end. It's, it's, it's like a map of ecological awareness. Tim, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. It, yes, thank and um, thanks for watching, and thanks for tuning in to the Cyrus Channel.